Well, let's get your Bibles in your hands. Let's have our confession. Say, this is my Bible. I can do what it says I can do. I can have what it says I can have. I can be who it says I can be. My mind's alert. My heart is receptive to receive the uncompromising, the unchanging, the infallible seed of the Word of God. For this is God's Word speaking to me. I'm going to be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. I said, I'm going to be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. You may be seated. You know, being a doer of the Word is the most important part. You can read the word, you can see the word, you can hear the word, you can quote the word, you can memorize the word, but if you're not a doer of the word, it's not going to work for you. Now you, under, you understand that, right? We have to be doers of the word. I've got an assignment tonight and my spirit has been grieving and So just bear with me tonight. We're going to do what I call an appetizer before we get into the real message. But I believe we got to get things right, folks. I said, we've got to get things right. My wife was showing me just the other day. I'm not, I don't talk about other ministries and things, but this is uh, very important that um, they had a, it's called a Stronger Men's Conference. You might have already heard about it. Stronger Men's Conference. I think it was in Missouri, but. Um, the opening of the service, they had hired a stripper, male stripper, to come to the conference and entertain the people that were there. Uh, uh, he didn't strip, he took off his shirt and did some, had a pole there, he climbed up on the pole, did some stuff, and swallowed a sword and things like that. And um, one of the ministers that was coming up special speakers, he come up and he rebuked that spirit of Jezebel that was happening in that service, which was the absolute right thing to do. And, uh, but long story short, he, the, 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 the head man come up, I don't even remember his name. He came up and had him escorted off the stage, told him to leave, da, 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 da. They went back in private conference and he actually talked him into coming back and apologizing. So he come back and apologized, and uh, but you know, and of course there was. They, I, I had heard that there was some souls that were saved there. Praise God! But but they, they they're saved into a watered down Christianity, and you know this day and time we see it all all over the television. We see it all over our our news, and you know there's so much compromising going on in this world. But we should not compromise what the Word of God says. We should never compromise what the Word says. And, you know, we can fall into traps. We can fall into enemy traps. You know, we, we pray, God, use me. God, change me. And uh, we want God to use us. We want God to change us. But there's a hedge around your prayers. Your prayers are being hindered through disobedience. We pray for God's will, God's purpose, and his desire to be fulfilled in our life. But we don't like the price we got to pay. So his will is not going to be fulfilled in your life because you don't willing to pay the price. You're not willing to sacrifice. I said you're not willing to sacrifice. We got to where we don't even come to church on Wednesday nights. Too much of a sacrifice. Don't want to come to church on even Sunday mornings. It's too much of a sacrifice. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the ones watching online. But, you know, we got to get it right. I'm telling you, we got to get things right. We're living in the last days. We're living in the last days. You see, we know the last days talk about wars and rumors of wars. And we see it. It's, it's coming. It's here now. Rumors of wars are here right now. Not much got to go on after that. Now, I'm not predicting the time frame. The Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour. 
But how can we rebuke the devourer for our sake when we're living in sin? The sin that easily ensnares us. Over 70% of Christian men struggle with pornography. Was last year, I think I looked at the survey and it was 60 some percent. Guys, we got to get things right. We got to get things right. We got to see God as who He is. He's El Shaddai. He's the God that's more than enough. Hallelujah. I said, we got to get things right. We should be dangerous to the enemy. The enemy knows the word, he can quote the word. But we need to be dangerous to the enemy. I mean, we need to be, we need to walk this world like God walked this world, like Elijah walked the world, like Jesus, like Elisha walked this world. I mean, we, we have the same spirit in us that Elijah and Elisha had. Yes. We've been talking about the spirit of Elisha. And I mean, you know what? His spirit was that he did what God wanted him to do. He dedicated his life to doing what God wanted him to do. So I want to pick up on this again about Elisha. And um, I don't know that I'll even get through tonight. We got, I got quite a bit of stuff here, but I just want to retract a little bit and uh, talk about, you can't talk about Elisha without talking about Elijah. Elijah was a strong man of God. We know he was. He Many <laughs> miracles he did. He... he uh, one of the ones that's very familiar, he prayed that it wouldn't rain. He stopped the rain from happening. Not just in Hampton, Virginia. Not just in Israel. It did not rain on the earth for three and a half years. He did that because of the uh, sexual immorality, the idolatry that was going on in Ahab and Israel. But he prayed that it would not rain. And it did not rain. And of course, when he prayed and it rained, it came back and it rained. But Elijah raised the boy from the dead. He did many miracles in the Bible. He, uh, he, he also multiplied oil. And, uh, but Elijah, uh, of course, you know, he called fire down from heaven. One of the, the later miracles he did is when he called fire down from heaven to the altar of the competition between his God and Baal. You remember that? And uh, so we're going to pick up on after that. But after that, um, he departed. So it says, 1 Kings 19, verse 19, says, So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12th, the 12th oxen. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Now, let me back up just a little bit. God had told Elijah to go and get a helper. I'm going to anoint Elisha to be your successor. So he had already told Elijah to go to him and to be his successor. So Elijah come by and threw his mantle on him. And, of course, Elijah found Elisha working in the field with the 12 oxen, and he commissioned him to be a part of his ministry. Now, he prayed for Elijah. He gave him uh, the calling that God had placed on his heart. Now, it's estimated between 8 to 10 years that Elisha, served Elijah. He didn't, he, he didn't, there's no record of him uh, performing any miracles. Of course, the miracles come through God, but there was no record of through him any miracles that were performed because he served Elijah. He was called eight to 10 years before, but you know, there is a training period. I said, there is a training period. And Elisha was being trained by Elijah. Amen. So he said, he, so he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he was with the 12th, and Elijah passed him by and threw his mantle on him. There was absolutely no doubt that Elijah and Elisha, both spiritually empowered men of God, both walked with God, they represented God, and listen to this, they showed us what a covenant relationship with God looks like. So what covenant faithfulness looks like through the obedience to God. So we see that Elisha and Elijah was one of the two um, men that was imparted, spiritually empowered, to show us, you and I, examples of how we can live on this earth the way they did, through the covenant relationship. 
Are y'all with me? In other words, Elisha was setting an example of how us Christians are supposed to live being spiritually empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I know the, the, the whole Bible was written for a reason, not just the New Testament, but there are some examples in the Old Testament of what we can take from. And one of the things that we can take from is the spirit of Elisha and Elijah, and that spirit was the Holy Spirit that resonated and lived on the inside of them. Are y'all with me? 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9 through 15, it says, So it was so when they had crossed over the Jordan River, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask may I do for you before I'm taken away from you. This was right before Elijah was carried up into heaven. Elijah didn't have to die. God took him up in heaven. Like I said before, him and Enoch was the only two that never saw death, period. They went straight to heaven. God took them up. That'd be a nice way to go, wouldn't it? But it says, what can I do for you, Elijah? Ask me, what can I do? And Elijah said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And we talked about the idea of a double portion in the Bible is um, one that means a double blessing. And it was cultured at the time or typically used in the Old Testament to refer to the birthright. At that time, the oldest son was given a double portion of the birthright or the double portion of the inheritance. Are y'all with me? So Elisha was saying, hey, I'm your adopted son. I want a double portion. Are y'all with me? So it says here that he gave him a double portion. And remember, Elisha had already been chosen to be Elijah's successor. So he wasn't asking to succeed Elijah because he'd already been anointed and called to succeed Elijah. But the request was for that spiritual empowerment, that Holy Spirit that Elijah had. He was asking for a double portion to fulfill the call that God had placed on Elijah to Elisha to finish. Are y'all with me? So Elisha saw and experienced how great the Spirit of God worked through Elijah, and he wanted the same anointing for himself. So let's pick it up here. Let's go back to um, verse, uh, verse 10. It says, so he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall be not be so. So let me just say, if you got time, you need to read that whole book of Second Kings. Because it goes into detail how Elijah tried to get Elisha to not go with him in three or four different places. But Elisha has said to Elijah, as God is on the throne, I'm not leaving you, not for a minute. So he was, what it was, that he was passing a test, what he was doing. He was passing a test and saying, I'm ready for this next chapter of my life. But it says in verse 11, then it happened as they continued and talked, they suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire, separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And of course, Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah. Elijah left his mantle to Elisha as a token of the descent of the spirits which came upon him. Elisha received Elijah's power and authority when his spirit descended upon him. Are y'all getting this? So at that moment, Elisha was filled with the Holy Spirit because he, there's no way Elisha could have done the miracles that God worked through him without being filled with the Holy Spirit. So it says here, um, verse 13, And he took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And we had also struck the water. It divided this way and that. And Elisha crossed over a dry, a, a dry river Jordan. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw, they said, the spirit of Elijah rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Are y'all with me? So we see that Elijah, Elisha grabbed the mantle and he struck the water to prove that he had, the Holy Spirit had come upon him, certainly had come upon him. But throughout the book of Kings, it's very apparent that Israel was still dealing with idolatry. 
Many people had rejected God in Israel, and they rejected God's covenant. But Elisha not only continued to serve as a prophet, calling people back to a covenant relationship with God, but as a spirit-empowered man who walked with God, who represented God, and who demonstrated the righteousness of God. He demonstrated the righteousness of God. We are declared righteous before God. But let me just tell you, you're not declared righteous if you're living unrighteously. You're not declared righteous unless you're living unrighteously. So we got to make sure we live in right standing with the Father. We don't get caught up in compromise. We don't get caught up in what the world's doing, but we live to please the Father. So we look at, when we look at Elijah's ministry, we look at Elisha's ministry, and we look at Jesus' ministry. All of them were pretty in the same kind of ministry. They walked, they walked to please the Father. They were obedient to the Father, and they lived righteously. They lived in right standing with the Father. Their main goal was to do what God wanted them to do. John 14, verses 12, 14 says, Most assuredly I say to you, this is Jesus speaking. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So two or three times he says, if you ask in my name, I will do it. Ask in what? You got to ask in faith. Like Dad said a while ago, you have to ask in faith. So Jesus was encouraging his disciples to believe in him. He was telling the disciples, you got to trust me. You got to believe in me. You got to trust me. Even when I'm not here, when I leave, you still got to believe in me and you still have to trust in me. Are you with me? So it says, because of who he is, then Jesus goes and describes the benefits and blessings that come to the one who believes. So when we see that God says, ask anything, and you only, he says, ask anything, he says, you'll be able to do even greater works than I did. We know God did some great work. I mean, Jesus did some great works while he was here on this earth. We know he healed the sick. We know he raised the dead. We know he walked on water. We know he caused the blind to see and the lame to walk. And we know he did these things, but he was saying even greater works you'll be able to do because I'm putting that same Holy Spirit, are y'all with me, inside of us. So when we become born again, we become, uh, we become the righteousness of God when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But it's up to us to maintain right standing with God in order for it to get the benefits of the Holy Spirit that is on the inside of us. Amen. Amen. I mean, we, you know, we, a lot of times we pray and pray and pray and some things don't happen. Well, are you living righteously before God? Are you hindering the Spirit from moving in you? Are y'all with me? Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus said that I'm not going to be here any, in the natural any longer, but I'm going to send back the power. Amen. He said, I'm not just sending back power. I'm sending back enough power to do everything that I did, and I'm sending more. So you'll be able to do everything that I did and then some. Hallelujah. It says here in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It didn't say you might. It said you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem, in the, all of Judah, and Samaria, and to all the end of the earth. And I like what the Amplified Bible says, you will receive power and ability. The Passion Translation says, you will be seized with power. And it also says, seize means to take hold of and take possession of. So we take possession of the power that has been given to us when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. But notice the similarities here between Elisha and Elisha and Jesus and his disciples. Elijah told Elisha, I'm giving you enough power to do everything I did and then some. I'm going to double it. And, of course, we see that Jesus told his disciples basically the same thing. 
I'm giving you enough power to do what I did and then some. Hallelujah. Everybody say, and then some. Glory. I said, glory. I said, glory. Um, let me go to, let's go to 2 Kings chapter 4. I'm going to skip a little bit. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8 and 10. It says, this is when um, Elisha finds a place to stay. It says, now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was as often as he passed by there, he would turn in there and eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes us by regularly. Verse 10 says, please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed in there for him and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there and basically get some rest. So this was, a, this was a powerful part in the Bible where Elisha had gained favor because God has gave him a place to stay when he was in that particular area. So let's move on to 2 Kings 4, verse 13. It says, And he said to this Shunammite woman, Say now to her, Look, you have been concerned for us with all this care. So he said us, so it must have been a servant with Elijah, I mean Elisha also. But Elisha said, what can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king of the commander or the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, and Gehazi was actually the servant of Elisha. Gehazi answered, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. So Elijah said, call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then Elijah said, about this time next year, you shall embrace the son. And he said, no, my Lord. I mean, she said, no, my Lord, don't, man of God, don't lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son when the appointed time had come. Exactly what Elijah had told her. That is what you call power and ability. <laughs> Hallelujah. And verse 18 said, the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. So his head was hurting. So he said to the servant, carry him to his mother. So the servant carried the child to the mother when he had taken him and brought him to his mother. He sat on her knees till noon. So she cradled him until noon. And then what happened? He died. The son died. I'm going to pick up the second Kings chapter four, verse 21 says, and she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. I said, he laid him on the bed of the man of God. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about Jewish custom. It was Jewish custom. As soon as someone dies, their eyes are to be closed. They were to be kissed with love. And the body was to be immediately washed and put perfume on. In this washing, the body was anointed with perfume. It was also customary for the body to be wrapped elaborately in a shroud and the face covered with a special cloth. The hands and feet were to be tied with strips of cloth and then friends and relatives would come and say their goodbyes. And then was the burial. All this would actually happen very quickly. And usually it was done less than eight hours. And they said if it was hot, it, was even, it would even happen less than that. So I got some notes in my Bible. So just bear with me here. So we see this, that the Shunammite woman actually didn't do none of this. She actually laid the boy on Elisha's bed. She didn't wash him or she didn't wrap him in a shroud. She didn't put cloth on his feet. She didn't tie his hands. She didn't even put perfume on him. Why? Because she wasn't preparing his, he, she wasn't preparing the boy for burial. 
she was preparing the boy for resurrection. Come on, amen. Come on, come on. She didn't, she, <laughs> she knew the God that was living on the inside. She knew the God that was living on the inside of Elisha. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Now, I'm going to I'm going to go to verse 21. It says, and when he laid him on the bed of the man of God, she shut the door behind him and went out. Now, verse 22, follow me here. Then she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and come back. So he said, why are you going to him today? It's not neither the new moon or the Sabbath. And she said, it is well. And it says, then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, drive and go forward. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. Now, this right here alone, just to her, just before she started, would take about an hour to get the donkey ready and to get things going. It would take about an hour. That's what's estimated. And then she says in verse 25, and so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. Elisha was speaking at Mount Carmel. Now, Mount Carmel was 25 miles away, which was estimated six hours time on a donkey. Are y'all still with me? Verse 25, so she departed, went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man God saw afar off, and he said to his servant, Gehazi, look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, is it well? In other words, she, he said, is everything okay? Please run to meet her and say, is it well? Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, it is well. That's what she said. It's well. It's everything's okay. But verse 22, I mean verse 28. No, I'm sorry, 27. Now that she came to the man of God up at the hill and she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi, which was Elijah's servant, came near to push her away. But the man of God, Elisha, said to her, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and not told me. Verse 28, so she said, did I ask the son of my Lord? Did I say, do not deceive me? So she was saying, why did you do this? Why did you have me have a child only for it to die? Basically what she was saying. So then he said to Gehazi, get yourself ready. Take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, don't greet them. Don't let them greet you. Do not answer it, but lay my staff on the face of the child. So he gave him the mantle, and Gehazi was a run to back to where the body was, which was 25 miles away. That's like doing a marathon, isn't it? So even if even if she, the, Gehazi did it supernaturally with the the way the marathon is, it would take at least three hours if you're running really, 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 really fast. It would take at least three hours. Uh, Elisha and the woman returned. With the, I guess they returned back on the donkey. Well, that's another six hours. So, this estimated time from the child dying to Elisha getting back to the child was at least 12 hours. Or they said it may even happen the next day. But let's look at verse 32. When Elisha came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed, on Elisha's bed. And he went, therefore, shut the door behind him, the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, the eyes on his eyes, and hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. Something's starting to happen in it. The flesh of the child became warm. So Elisha walks around back and forth in the house and things didn't happen as quickly as he wanted. So again, he went up and stretched himself out on him. Then the child sneezed seven times and he opened his eyes and he came back to life. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. That's what you call power and ability. Glory be to God. So, and why was Elisha able to do that? Because he had the Holy Spirit inside of him. He was full of the Holy Spirit. And why was he full of the Holy Spirit? Well, probably because he didn't stay on his cell phone 10 hours a day. He probably didn't watch TV. 
eight hours a day, six hours a night. Elisha was willing to pay the sacrifice of just merely being obedient. Hallelujah. I said just merely being obedient. That's all we have to do. It's not hard, folks. We just have to say no to some things. We have to say no to the sin that easily ensnares us. And let's get on with the relationship with God that he called us to do. Amen? amen. I said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Kim, you come on up. I wanted to get into um, the spirit. I'm going to get into Naaman's leprosy healed, but it's going to take quite a bit of a while to get to that and go through that. But I just want you to know that what is amazing is when Elisha asked for a double portion of the anointing, it was actually exactly, Elisha did exactly a double portion of miracles. Exactly. It says that uh, it was documented that Elijah did 14 miracles and it was documented that Elisha's ministry did 28 miracles. So that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Exactly a double portion of the anointing. You probably should have asked for three times the anointing. <laughs> but folks, I'm here to tell you that God has no respect to person. What he did for Elisha, he can do for us. We just got to get serious about the things of God. We got to get back on track. We got to make things right. We got to get up every morning and just, hey, I'm here today to please the Father. Get rid of stuff in your life that doesn't need to be there. And stuff can be a number of things, not just sin. You've heard me say many times, good things can become God things. And uh, so we got to watch out for that, you know. And um, we're living in such an entertainment society. We're living in such a uh, society where everything that's not right with God seems to be normal. You know, it's uh, I'm trying to say this without... In other words, you know, living with each other seems to be a normal thing. Having sex before marriage seems to be a normal thing. That's not what God says. It's just not. You know, the word says that God created man for a woman. He created a woman for a man. And it's not normal for a man to be with a man. It's not normal for a woman to be with a woman. You know, just because it's normal, don't, there seems to be normal, doesn't make it right. And uh, so we got to get back to real, we got to get back to the things of God. We got to get back to trusting God and believing every word is true in the Bible and displaying the righteousness of God, you know, and it's good that we come to church and we should come to church, but don't come to church and live in sin. Come to church to live righteousness before God. You know, none of us are perfect. I'm not standing here a perfect man. None of us are perfect, but I try to be perfect. I try to excel in perfection. And uh, God will see your heart. Your heart is what's going to display everything that is happening in your life. Your heart. God judges you by your heart. And he knows your heart. Amen. Amen.